Good evening, this is Quintus Curtius, and this podcast is going to be a reading of the H.G. Wells short story, The Sea Raiders. The Sea Raiders. And this short story was first published in 1896 in the Weekly Sun Literary Supplement. And it is a fictional story describing an attack by a previously unknown species of squid in the coast of Devon in England. So here we go. The Sea Raiders by H.G. Wells. Until the extraordinary affair at Sidmouth, the peculiar species Haplotutis ferox was known to science only generically on the strength of a half-digested tentacle obtained near the Azores and a decaying body pecked by birds and nibbled by fish found early in 1896 by Mr. Jennings near Land's End. In no department of zoological science, indeed, are we quite so much in the dark as with regard to the deep-sea cephalopods. A mere accident, for instance, it was that led to the Prince of Monaco's discovery of nearly a dozen new forms in the summer of 1895, a discovery in which the before-mentioned tentacle was included. It chanced that a cachalot was killed off Terceira by some sperm whalers, and in its last struggles charged almost to the prince's yacht, missed it, rolled under, and died within twenty yards of his rudder. And in its agony it threw up a number of large objects which the prince, which the prince dimly perceiving they were strange and important, was, by a happy expedient, able to secure before they sank. He set his screws in motion and kept them circling in the vortices thus created until a boat could be lowered. And these specimens were whole cephalopods and fragments of cephalopods, some of gigantic proportions, and almost all of them unknown to science. It would seem, indeed, that these large and agile creatures living in the middle depths of the sea must, to a large extent, forever remain unknown to us since underwater they are too nimble for nets, and it is only by such rare, unlooked-for accidents that specimens can be obtained. In the case of Haplotutus ferox, for instance, we are still altogether ignorant of its habitat, as ignorant as we are of the breeding ground of the herring or the seaways of the salmon. And zoologists are altogether at a loss to account for its sudden appearance on our coast. Possibly it was the stress of a hunger migration that drove it hither out of the deep. But it will be perhaps better to avoid necessarily inconclusive discussion and to proceed at once with our narrative. The first human being to set eyes upon a living haplotutis, the first human being to survive, that is, for there can be little doubt now that the wave of bathing fatalities and floating accidents that traveled along the coast of Cornwall and Devon in early May was due to this cause. Was a retired tea dealer of the name of Fison who was stopping at a Sidmouth boarding house. It was in the afternoon, and he was walking along the cliff path between Sidmouth and Ladram Bay. The cliffs in this direction are very high, but down the red face of them in one place, a kind of ladder staircase has been made. He was near this when his, inten- was in- when his attention was attracted by what at first he thought to be a cluster of birds struggling over a fragment of food that caught the sunlight and glistened pinkish white. The tide was right out, and this object was not only far below him, but remote across a broad waste of rock reefs covered with dark seaweed and interspersed with silvery, shining tidal pools. And he was, moreover, dazzled by the brightness of the further water. In a minute, regarding this again, he perceived that his judgment was in fault, for over this struggle circled a number of birds, jackdaws, and gulls for the most part, the latter gleaming blindingly when the sunlight smote their wings, and they seemed minute in comparison with it. And his curiosity was, perhaps, aroused all the more strongly because of this first insufficient explanations. As he had nothing better to do than amuse himself, he decided to make this object, whatever it was, the goal of his afternoon walk, instead of Ladram Bay, conceiving it might perhaps be a great fish of some sort, stranded by some chance, and flapping about in its distress.' 
and so he hurried down the long steep ladder, stopping at intervals of 30 feet or so to take breath and scan the mysterious movement. At the foot of the cliff he was, of course, nearer his object than he had been. But, on the other hand, it now came up against his it now came up against the incandescent sky beneath the sun so as to seem dark and indistinct whatever was pinkish of it was now hidden by a scary of weedy boulders but he perceived that it was made up of seven rounded bodies distinct or connected and that the birds kept up a constant croaking and screaming but seemed afraid to approach it too closely mr fison Torn by curiosity, began picking his way across the wave-worn rocks and, finding the wet seaweed that covered them thickly rendered uh, them seemingly slippery, he stopped, removed his shoes and socks, and coiled his trousers above his knees. His object was, of course, merely to avoid stumbling into the rocky pools about him, and perhaps he was rather glad, as all men are, of an excuse to resume, even for a moment, the sensations of his boyhood. At any rate, it is to this, no doubt, that he owes his life. He approached his mark with all the assurance which the absolute security of this country against all forms of animal life gives its inhabitants. The round bodies moved to and fro, and it was only when he surmounted the scary of boulders I have mentioned that he realized the horrible nature of the discovery. It came upon him with some suddenness. The rounded bodies fell apart as he came into sight over the ridge and displayed the pinkish object to be the partially devoured body of a human being. But whether of a man or woman, he was unable to say. And the rounded bodies were new and ghastly looking creatures in shape somewhat resembling an octopus and with huge and very long and flexible tentacles coiled copiously on the ground. The skin had a glistening texture, unpleasant to see, like shiny leather. The downward bend of the tentacle surrounded mouth, the curious excrescence of the bend, the tentacles, and the large intelligent eyes gave the creatures a grotesque suggestion of a face. They were the size of a fair-sized swine about the body, and the tentacles seemed to him to be many feet in length. There were, he thinks, seven or eight at least of the creatures. Twenty yards beyond them, amid the surf of the now returning tide, two others were emerging from the sea. The bodies lay flatly on the rocks, and their eyes regarded him with evil interest. But it does not appear that Mr. Fison was afraid, or that he realized that he was in any danger. Possibly his confidence is to be ascribed to the limpness of their attitudes. But he was horrified, of course, and intensely excited and indignant at such revolting creatures preying upon human flesh. He thought they had chanced upon a drowned body. He shouted at them with the idea of driving them off and, finding they did not budge, cast about him, picked up a big rounded lump of rock and flung it at one of them. And then, slowly uncoiling their tentacles, they all began moving towards him, creeping at first deliberately and making a soft purring sound to each other. In a moment, Mr. Fison realized that he was in danger. He shouted again, threw both his boots and started off with a leap forthwith. Twenty yards off, he stopped and faced about, judging them slow, and behold, the tentacles of their leader were already pouring over the rocky ridge on which he had just been standing. At that he shouted again, and this time not threatening, but a cry of dismay, and began jumping, striding, slipping, wading across the uneven expanse between him and the beach. The tall red cliffs seemed suddenly at a vast distance, and he saw, as though they were creatures in another world, two minute workmen engaged in the repair of the ladder way, and little suspecting the race for life that was beginning below them. At one time he could hear the creatures splashing in the pools not a dozen feet behind him, and once he slipped and almost fell. They chased him to the very foot of the cliffs, and desisted only when he had been joined by the workmen at the foot of the ladder way up the cliff 
All three of the men pelted them with stones for a time, and then hurried to the cliff top and along the path toward, towards Sidmouth to secure assistance in a boat and to rescue the desecrated body from the clutches of these abominable creatures. And, as if he had not already been in insufficient peril that day, Mr. Fison went with the boat to point out the exact spot of his adventure. As the tide was down, it required a considerable detour to reach the spot, and when at last they came off the ladder way, the mangled body had disappeared. The water was now running in, submerging first one slab of slimy rock and then another, and the four men in the boat, the workmen, that is, the boatman and Mr. Fison, now turned their attention from the bearings offshore to the water beneath the keel. At first they could see little below them, save a dark jungle of la marina with an occasional darting fish their minds were set on adventure and they expressed their disappointment freely but presently they saw one of the monsters swimming swimming through the water seaward with a curious rolling motion that suggest, suggested to mr fison the spinning roll of a captive balloon almost immediately after the waving streamers of Laminaria were extraordinarily perturbed, parted for a moment, and three of these beasts came darkly visible, struggling for what was probably some fragment of the drowned man. In a moment, the copious olive green ribbons had poured again over this writhing group. At that, all four men, greatly excited, began beating the water with oars and shouting, and immediately saw a tumultuous movement among the weeds. They desisted to see more clearly, and as soon as this water was smooth, they saw, as it seemed to them, the whole sea bottom among the weeds set with eyes. "'Ugly swine!' cried one of the men. "'Why, there's dozens!' And forthwith the things began to rise through the water about them. Mr. Fison has since described to this writer this startling eruption out of the waving laminaria meadows. To him it seemed to occupy a considerable time, but it's probable that really it was an affair of a few seconds only. For a time nothing but eyes, and then he speaks of tentacles streaming out and parting the weed fronds this way and that. Then these things, growing larger, until at last the bottom was hidden by their intercoiling forms, and the tips of tentacles rose darkly here and there into the air above the swell of the waters. One came up boldly by the, to the side of the boat and, clinging to this with three of its sucker-set tentacles, threw four others over the gunwale, as if with an intention either of oversetting the boat or of clambering into it. Mr. Fison at once caught up the boat hook and, jabbing furiously at the soft tentacles, forced it to desist. He was struck in the back and almost pitched overboard by the boatman, who was using his oar to resist a similar attack on the other side of the boat. But the tentacles on either side at once relaxed their hold at this, slid out of sight, and splashed into the water. "'We'd better get out of this,' said Mr. Fison, who was trembling violently. He went to the tiller, while the boatman and one of the workmen seated themselves and began rowing. The other workmen stood up, in the fore part of the boat with the boat hook ready to strike any more tentacles that might appear nothing else seems to have been said mr fison had expressed the common feeling towards mr fison had expressed the common feeling beyond amendment in a hushed scared mood with faces white and drawn they set about escaping from the position into which they had so rec recklessly blundered but the oars had scarcely dropped into the water before dark, tapering serpentine ropes had bound them, and were about the rudder, and creeping up the sides of the boat with a long, with a looping motion came the suckers again. The men gripped their oars and pulled, but it was like trying to move a boat in a floating raft of weeds. Help here, cried the boatman, and Mr. Fison and the second workman rushed to help lug at the oar. Then the man with the boat hook, his name was Ewan, or Ewan, sprang up with a curse and began striking downward over the side as far as he could reach at the bank of tentacles that now clustered along the boat's bottom, and at the same time 
the two rowers stood up to get a better purchase for the recovery of their oars. The boatman handed his to Mr. Fison, who lugged desperately, and, meanwhile, the boatman opened a, opened a big clasp knife and, leaning over the side of the boat, began hacking at the spring arm, the, the spiring arms upon the oar shaft. Mr. Fison, staggering with the quivering rocking of the boat, his teeth set, his breath coming short, and the veins starting on his hands as he pulled at his oar, suddenly cast his eyes seaward. And there, not fifty yards off, along the long rollers of the incoming tide, was a large boat standing in towards them, with three women and a little child in it. A boatman was rowing, and a little man in a pink-ribboned straw hat and whites stood in the stern, hailing them. For a moment, of course, Mr. Fison thought of help, and then he thought of the child. He abandoned his oar forthwith, threw up his arms in a frantic gesture, and screamed to the party in the boat to keep away, for God's sake. It says much for the modesty and courage of Mr. Fison that he does not seem to be aware that there was any quality of heroism in his action at this juncture. The oar he had abandoned was at once drawn under and presently reappeared, floating about twenty yards away. At the same moment, Mr. Fison felt the boat under him lurch violently, and a hoarse scream, a prolonged cry of terror from Hill, the boatman, caused him to forget the party of excursionists altogether. He turned and saw Hill crouching by the forward rowlock, his face convulsed with terror, and his right arm over the side and drawn tightly down. He gave now a succession of short, sharp cries, Oh, oh, oh! Mr. Fison believes that he must have been hacking at the tentacles below the waterline, and to have been grasped by them, but, of course, it is quite impossible to say now certainly what had happened. The boat was heeling over, so that the gunwale was within ten inches of the water, and both Ewan and the other laborer were striking down into the water with oar and boat hook on either side of Hill's arm. Mr. Fison instinctively placed himself to counterpoise them. Then Hill, who was a burly, powerful man, made a strenuous effort and rose almost to a standing position. He lifted his arms, indeed, clean out of the water. Hanging to it was a complicated tangle of brown ropes, and the eyes of one of the brutes that had hold of him, glaring straight and resolute, showed momentarily above the surface. The boat heeled more and more, and the green-brown water came pouring in at cascade over the side. Then Hill slipped and fell with his ribs across the side, and his arm and the mass of tentacles about it splashed back into the water. He rolled over. His boot kicked Mr. Fison's knee at that, as that gentleman rushed forward to seize him. And in another moment, fresh tentacles had whipped about his waist and neck, and after a brief convulsive struggle in which the boat was nearly capsized, Hill was lugged overboard. The boat righted with a violent jerk that all but sent Mr. Fison over the side and hid the struggle in the water from his eyes. He stood staggering to recover his balance for a moment, and as he did so, he became aware that the struggle and the inflowing tide had carried them close upon the weedy rocks again. Not four yards off, a table of rock still rose in rhythmic movements above the inwash of the tide. In a moment, Mr. Fison seized the oar from Ewan, gave one vigorous stroke, then, dropping it, ran to the bows, the bows, and leaped. He felt his feet slide over the rock and, by a frantic effort, leaped again towards a further mass. He stumbled over this, came to his knees, and rose again. Look out! cried someone, and a large drab body nearly struck him. He was knocked flat into a tidal pool by one of the workmen, and as he went down he heard smothered, choking cries that he believed at the time came from Hill. Then he found himself marveling at the shrillness and variety of Hill's voice. Someone jumped over him, and a curving rush of foamy water poured over him and passed. He scrambled to his feet, dripping and, without looking seaward, ran as fast as his terror would let him shoreward. Before him, over the flat surface of scattered rocks, stumbled the two workmen, one a dozen yards in front of the other. 
He looked over his shoulder at last and, seeing that he was not pursued, faced about. He was astonished. From the moment of the rising of the cephalopods out of the water, he had been acting too swiftly to fully comprehend his actions. Now it seemed to him as if he had suddenly jumped out of an evil dream. For there were the sky, cloudless and blazing with the afternoon sun, the sea weltering under its pitiless brightness, the soft, creamy foam of the breaking water, and the low, long, dark ridges of rock. The righted boat floated, rising and falling gently on the swell about a dozen yards from shore. Hill and the monsters, all the stress and tumult of that fierce fight for life, had vanished as though they had never been. Mr. Fison's heart was beating violently. He was throbbing to the fingertips, and his breath came deep. There was something missing. For some seconds he could not think clearly enough what this might be. Sun, sky, sea, rocks. What was it? Then he remembered the boatload of excursionists. It had vanished. He wondered whether he had imagined it. He turned and saw the two workmen standing by the side of the projecting masses of the tall pink cliffs. He hesitated whether he should make one last attempt to save the man Hill. His physical excitement seemed to desert him suddenly and leave him aimless and helpless. He turned shoreward, stumbling and wading towards his two companions. He looked back again, and there were now two boats floating, and the one farthest out at sea pitched clumsily bottom upward. So it was that Haplotutus Ferox made its appearance upon the Devonshire coast. So far, this has been its most serious aggression. Mr. Fison's account, taken together with the wave of boating and bathing casualties to which I have already alluded, and the absence of fish from the Cornish coasts that year, points clearly to a shoal of these voracious deep-sea monsters prowling slowly among the subtidal coastlines. Hunger migration has, I know, been suggested as the force that drove them hither. But for my own part, I prefer to believe the alternative theory of Helmsley. Helmsley holds that a pack or shoal of these creatures may have become enamored of human flesh by the accident of a foundered ship sinking amongst them and have wandered in search of it out of their accustomed zone, first waylaying and following ships and so coming to our shores in the wake of the Atlantic traffic. But to discuss Helmsley's cogent and admirably stated arguments would be out of place here. It would seem that the appetites of the shoal were satisfied by the catch of eleven people. For so far as can be ascertained, there were ten people in the second boat, and certainly these creatures gave no further sign of their presence off Sidmouth that day. The coast between Seaton and Budley Salter Salterton was patrolled all that evening and night by four Preventine service boats, the men in which were armed with harpoons and cutlasses, and as the evening advanced, a number or of more or less similarly equipped expedition organized by private individuals joined them. Mr. Fison took no part in any of these expeditions. About midnight, excited hails were heard from a boat about a couple of miles out at sea to the southeast of Sidmouth, and a lantern was seen waving in a strange manner to and fro and up and down. The nearer boats at once hurried towards the alarm. The venturesome occupants of the boat, a seaman, a curate, and two schoolboys, had actually seen the monsters passing under their boat. The creatures, it seems, like most deep-sea organisms, were phosphorescent, and they had been floating five fathoms deep or so like creatures of moonshine through the blackness of the water, their tentacles retracted as if asleep, rolling over and over and moving slowly in a wedge-like formation towards the southeast. These people told their story in gesticulated fragments. At first one boat drew alongside, alongside and then another. At last there was a little fleet of eight or nine boats collected together, and from them a tumult, like the chatter of a marketplace, rose into the stillness of the night. There was little or no disposition to pursue the shoal, 
the people had neither weapons nor experience for such a dubious chase, and presently, even within a certain relief it may be, the boats turned shoreward. And now to tell what is perhaps the most astounding fact in this whole astonishing raid. We have not the slightest knowledge of the subsequent movements of the shoal, although the whole southwest coast was now alert for it. But it may perhaps be significant that a cachalot was stranded off Sark on June 3rd. Two weeks and three days after this Sidmouth affair, a living haplotutus came ashore on Calais sands. It was alive because several witnesses saw its tentacles moving in a convulsive way, but it is probable that it was dying. A gentleman named Pouchet obtained a rifle and shot it. That was the last appearance of a living haplotutus. No others were seen on the French coast. On the 15th of June, a dead body, almost complete, was washed ashore named Torquay, and a few days later a boat from the Marine Biological Station, engaged in dredging off Plymouth, picked up a rotting specimen, slashed deeply with a cutlass wound. How the former specimen had come by its death it is impossible to say. And on the last day of June, Mr. Egbert Kane, an artist, bathing near Newlyn, threw up his arms, shrieked, and was drawn under. A friend, a friend bathing with him made no attempt to save him, but swam at once for the shore. This is the last fact to tell of this extraordinary raid from the deeper sea. Whether it is really the last of these horrible creatures, it is, as yet, premature to say. But it is believed, and certainly it is to be hoped, that they have returned now, and returned for good, to the sunless depths of the Middle Seas, out of which they have so strangely and so mysteriously arisen.